Now, Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this, the latest in our series of webinars. We host today's event under the banner of the Centre for Intelligent Design in the UK, and we're really pleased that you've joined us for this session. Uh, you may be aware that our objective over these last many months has been to present a sequence of topics which provide an understanding of aspects of design in nature, and we've been particularly keen to share evidence that calls the default understanding about the origin and complexity of living systems and their many characteristics into question. Asking such questions and considering such evidence is not only the healthy pursuit of truth, it's the way that scientific understanding has developed and grown over the last several hundred years. And looking back over the last 18 or so webinars, we've covered a lot of ground over the past few years, some of it's been biochemical, physiological, some of it's been more reflective from a philosophical point of view, but all of it has challenged the naturalist paradigm and has demonstrated the case for real design in nature. And it's been our pleasure to host some of the best known contributors to the design arena. And today's guest is no exception. Incidentally, you'll find a see the series of our previous webinar recordings uh, under our YouTube channel. It's also accessible on the C4ID website. But on the channel, make sure that you, you uh, sign up, get the notifications about future videos. And as usual, you'll have an opportunity today to post questions or comments, which we can discuss and tackle after today's talk. If you post that using the chat facility on YouTube, uh, my colleague David Williams will moderate the Q&A session a little later. Now today we are delighted to welcome for the first time, Professor Stuart Burgess. Stuart is the Professor of Engineering Design at Bristol University. Uh, he is known for involvement in a number of additional projects. He was the lead designer for the European Space Agency, as well as the British Olympic cycling team. He designed the chain sprocket transmission system for the Team GB bikes that were competing in the Rio Olympics in 2016, where the team was spectacularly successful, as indeed they were in other Olympics and other world and European championships. It'll be no surprise that he's also been the winner of numerous international awards. He's an expert in the design of engineering systems and has a particular interest in bio-inspired designs. He's recently written about such as the biological joints, as, as knees, wings, jaws, and has analyzed the subtle and ingenious linkage mechanisms, demonstrating how they are highly optimized for efficient motion. Today, we're delighted his topic is the incredible design of human hands and feet. So with great pleasure, let me introduce Stuart Burgess. Stuart, it's over to you. Go ahead and uh, we look forward very much to hearing your talk, and then David will pick it up uh, when the talk is complete. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. The first thing I've got to do is to share my screen. Oops. So, as, have I shared my screen okay? Yes. You have. Okay, thank that's you. It. That's it. Perfect. Uh, so, the incredible design of human hands and feet. Uh, the first thing I want to do is to start with a motivation for this talk. Um, I have been carrying out robotics research for about 35 years. That started with working for the European Space Agency. Uh, one of the first projects I worked on was lead designer for the robotic arm for Envisat, the world's largest Earth observation satellite. Uh, then working at Bristol University, I've worked on bio-inspired designs for robotic uh, hands, and robotic and prosthetic feet. I um, also worked on artificial muscle uh, as well. In 2021, I had a fellowship at Clare Hall College, Cambridge University, where I focused on work on robotic hands and feet. Uh, I'm currently editor of two bioengineering 
uh, journal. So I've seen a lot of work published in this uh, area. And one of the motivation I would share is from Psalm 139, verse 14, speaking of man being fearfully and wonderfully made. And my testimony of uh, working in the lab for 35 years is that uh, that verse has been, uh, I think, demonstrated by scientific uh, evidence. So that's the motivation for the talk. In this first part of the talk, I will speak about the unique human hand uh, and then later move on to the human foot. Uh, human hands are designed for dexterity and for skill. Very, very different to ape hands, which are designed for strength and toughness. Uh, ape hands are wonderfully designed, but for something really quite uh, different. We often hear that humans are supposedly very similar to chimpanzees and apes. Uh, but in, in the case of the hands, our hands are very, very different. So some of the unique features of the human hand, we have an opposable thumb uh, with nine muscles. Um, apes don't have an opposable thumb. They have fewer muscles. In the case of a human hand, we can even make a tripod grip, not just a pinch grip with each finger. Uh, but as you can see, holding a pen, we have that tripod uh, grip, very important for dexterity. Uh, humans have a middle finger that locks and gives a strong grip. Uh, humans have a flexible palm and a flexible wrist, uh, very important for all kinds of dexterous movements. And then humans have fine muscle control and fine a fine sense of touch. And I'll be explaining uh, uh, some of these things in, in this section. So just to give an illustration of the incredible dexterity and speed of the human hand, just to give you the example of knitting, uh, how many stitches can a human make in 60 seconds? That There's actually a world championship for people who are very good at knitting and that there's, there's a world champion for knitting. Uh, now, when you're thinking about this, you have to remember it takes about eight steps to make one stitch so i think i would make about one stitch in 60 seconds if i tried this well the world record is actually 118 stitches in 60 seconds and that corresponds to about 944 movements and the world record holder is a lady called miriam teagles you can look that up on the guinness world records but that just gives you one example of the incredible dexterity and speed potential of the human hand and hands. Uh, just one more example, this time from music. Music uh, is very good at illustrating the, the skill of human hands. This is a Ukrainian pianist, uh, Lubomir Mel Malnik, and he can play up to 20 notes per second, not just 20 notes per second, but played with skill and feeling and precision. Music uh, very much illustrates the skill of the human hands. Uh, it's it's useful to compare human hands versus robotic hands to 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 to, to illustrate their skill. Human hands have superior functionality, superior pre precision, uh, superior force control, and superior touch. And this is despite engineers using the most advanced actuators, the most advanced materials um, with lots of resources. It's very difficult to begin to match the performance of the human hand. It's actually quite humbling uh, building robots because you realize just how good uh, the, the uh, human hands are. So in this section, I'm going to uh, show you some of the finger movements and, and how they and how they actually happen. Uh, so there are six main uh, finger movements. Uh, they're actually pairs of movements uh, when you consider the antagonistic muscles. You can have full flexion of your finger and full extension. Secondly, you can have half finger flexion. You can bend half your finger. Thirdly, you can have a knuckle flexion where you just bend your fingers around your knuckles with a straight finger. Then you can have a push and retract motion uh, if you're, for example, pressing buttons on a keyboard. Then you can have abduction, moving your fingers sideways, and you can even have circumduction, 
where you can move your fingers in a kind of uh, a circle. Now, that is an incredible amount of functionality in a very small space. Uh, and when you consider there are no muscles in the fingers themselves, it's, it's really quite incredible what the fingers can do. When engineers build robotic hands, they can normally only get one or two of these uh, functions. No one has managed to get all six of these functions in, in a robotic hand. So I'm going to attempt to show you how the tendons can produce these motions. Um, it's very difficult to find a medical book which illustrates these, but I've spent a few years producing some diagrams, as you'll see. Just before I show you, I just need to show you two anatomy diagrams. So the first one is from Gray's Anatomy, uh, a famous work in the anatomy of the human body. On the left hand picture shows the back of the left hand and the right hand picture shows the palm, the front of the left hand. And so in each picture, the darker area are showing you the muscles and the tendons are shown in white. And as you can see, it's really very, very complicated. I can reassure you that some researchers have looked at these, studied these for decades and still do not fully understand how this whole system works because you have a tensegrity system, a network of tendons. Um, it, it's not a question of one muscle pulling one tendon. All the tendons are connected. So you get this force that interacts between different uh, tendons and it, it's it's very complicated how the whole system works at the top you can see that you have split tendons both on the back of the hand and on the front of the hand some of the tendons split so they can go around other tendons uh, it, it's a very complex uh, assembly just looking at the notation on the left you can see that there are no muscles in the fingers this is really important because the fingers, that makes them very slender. And that, that's part of the skill and dexterity of the fingers, that they're very slender. Uh, and that's possible because the muscles are put into the palm of the hand and also in the lower arm. In fact, most of the muscles of the hand are actually placed in the lower arm. That helps the hand to be very compact. Um, but it also means that it gives form to the palm of the hand and the uh, lower arm. So muscles perform not just an actuation, but also a form uh, function. So the anatomy is very uh, complex. What I'm gonna do now is show you the anatomy of just one finger, the index finger. And this, this is a diagram that I've produced myself. On the top is a, a diagram of the tendons of the index finger looking from the side. The diagram at the bottom is looking down on top of the uh, index finger. You can see I've shown you the three uh, uh, centers of rotation of the three joints. Uh, you have the knuckle joint or the MCP joint, that's the metocarpophalangeal joint. Then you have the pip joint, the middle finger joint, that's the proximal interphalangeal joint. And then the dip joint, that's the distal interphalangeal uh, joint. And what you can see is that the tendons attach to different bones. So just starting on the bottom diagram, looking on top of the index finger, there is a, a short extensor tendon that doesn't go as far as the last bone. It goes to the penultimate bone of a finger. Then there's a long extensor tendon that splits so that it can get past the short extensor tendon and the long extensor tendon goes to the last bone. Now this is very complicated, but this is this one of the secrets to the dexterity of a finger that you can pull on different bones. If you then look at the diagram above, uh, you can then see underneath the index finger, we have the same uh, approach where you have a short flexor tendon uh, which only goes as far as the penultimate bone of the finger, and you have a long flexor tendon that goes to the last bone. Again, that enables you to do uh, very particular movements with the finger. Uh, but then right at the top, you can see three diagonal 
tendons at the knuckle. Now, these th this this is a very clever feature because by having a diagonal tendon that goes from the bottom to the top, that enables you to perform flexion and extension in different ways at different uh, joints. So in total, we have seven tendons, very difficult to package into a tiny finger, but it's done brilliantly in the case of the human finger. What I'm not showing you on this diagram is that there are also lubricating sheaths that align and lubricate uh, the tendons. So we have seven tendons. And in the case of the index finger, we have seven uh, muscles. And depending which group of muscles work, you can produce very complex movements in the fingers. So I'm now going to go through those six finger movements. So first of all, flexion, extension at all the joints. So if you come down from the top, if you pull that long flexor tendon, it has the effect of pulling your finger down. So when you curl your finger, when you flex your finger, what you're doing is you're activating a muscle in your lower arm. It pulls that long flexor tendon and you curl your finger. Of course, you're not really very conscious of what you're doing, but that's what your brain uh, is doing. Now, when you extend your finger, you have then another muscle in your lower arm, the long extensor tendon. So the, this is an antagonistic pair. The long extensor tendon, when that gets pulled, just moving up on that right hand diagram, that then pulls the finger and extends it up. So when you flex and extend your finger, those are the two tendons that are working. So this is one of the simpler movements. If we go to flexion extension just at the middle joint, this is a little bit harder uh, to do, but if but 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 most people can move their finger at the middle joint. In this case, you're mainly using your short flexor tendon because that doesn't pull the finger from the last bone, it pulls it from the penultimate bone, and that enables you to just to move half your finger in flexion. Then likewise, if you then pull your short extensor tendon, you're able to move your finger back up. Now, it may be not often you have to move half your finger, but for some dexterous activities, perhaps knitting, sometimes it's useful to bend your finger um, in this way. But humans can make these very specific, accurate movements with their hand. But then as I was explaining, Laning, you can also perform a knuckle flexion where you have a straight finger and you just pull it around your knuckle joint, the MCP joint. Now, to do this, this is when you're using those very clever um, angled tendons. Uh, now, they're uh, partly pulled by the lumbrical uh, muscle. So this is the lumbrical tendon. And as you can see, it it moves the finger in flexion around the MCP joint, but because it's at an angle, it's not pulling the other joints in flexion. So that enables your straight finger to move around the MCP joint. So your brain knows all of these things. Your brain is able to engage uh, different uh, tendons, knowing exactly what movement uh, you, you want to make. Then if you want to raise your finger, you then use the long extensor uh, tendon uh, so you can move a straight finger up and down. So there are three types of movement, uh, especially using the extensor flexor tendons. But then we come to a bit of a complicated motion because we are able to do a pressing and retracting motion with our finger. We often do this if we're pressing a key on a mobile phone or a typewriter. And again, the lumbrical muscle and the lumbrical tendon is key to this motion, because if you look carefully, when that lumbrical tendon is forced, not only will it produce flexion around the knuckle joint, but it then pulls the top tendon and produces extension at the top two joints. So what's clever about the lumbrical tendon is that it can produce a combination of flexion and extension at different joints. So this is where finger movement gets very sophisticated. 
And remarkably, these complex motions are produced without actuators actually in the fingers. When the first researchers started looking at all these tendons, they were quite astonished at uh, the ability of these tendons to produce motion in the fingers. So to retract, uh, you pull on other tendons to get that uh, finger to come back. Then the fingers can also uh, undergo abduction and adduction from side to side. Uh, here we have interossi tendons from interossi muscles, which are in the palm of the hand. Um, and as well as adduction and abduction, fingers can also go through circumduction. So they, they can go in a circular path in one way or the other. So another pair of movements and multiple tendons are uh, used to perform this motion. But remarkably, the human brain can activate all of these muscles very accurately to get the desired motion. We don't think too much about it. We just take for granted that we can move our fingers in all complicated ways. Now, as well as these, this amazing uh, range of movements, we also have fine muscle control. Now, researchers have found that in each of those 35 muscles, uh, on average, we have around 100 muscle units. Now, when we say there are 100 muscle units within one uh, muscle, what's meant is that each one of those 100 muscle units has its own nerve control. And that's very important because that means the brain can activate just one uh, one out of a hundred units in that muscle. It makes it easy for the brain to create a very light force and not just a light force, but to gradually increase force in a gentle way by gradually recruiting more and more individual muscle units. So in your hand, you have something like three and a half thousand muscle units. You have tremendous control over force. You can go from a very, very light force to a very heavy force. And not only that, but you can create literally billions of positions with your hands. And we also have fast twitch muscles, which explains why that Ukrainian pianist could play so many notes uh, per second. So our hands have not just great functionality of movement, but great precision in movement as well. Uh, our fingers have near frictionless joints because the coefficient of friction in synovial joints is around 0 0.002. And remarkably, that is around 25 times better than engineers have achieved with artificial joints. I mean, just to put that in perspective, engineers are very happy if from one year to the next, they can make a 5% improvement uh, in the reduction of friction. Well, 5% is going to take a very long time before we get 25 times uh, better. Again, it's a very humbling when you compare these uh, statistics. So our hands are remarkably smooth and it's not just synovial fluid in, in the joints, but also those guiding tunnels that the tendons are guided through. And then lastly, with the respect to the fingers, uh, our fingertips can feel the most minute uh, differences in surface. In fact, one researcher found our fingertips can feel a ridge of 13 nanometers. Uh, a nanometer is one millionth of a millimeter. Uh, it's something that you can't see with the naked eye, but our sense of touch is truly, truly remarkable. Uh, and that's important in areas of craft work and surgery and, and so on. So that's the remarkable design of human fingers. But now I just want to mention uh, something about the wrist joint. Uh, one of the reasons for looking at the wrist joint is it also has remarkable functionality, but it's a very small joint at the base of the hand that we often take for granted, but it is a truly remarkable joint. So I want to say a few things uh, about this. Now the wrist joint has eight bones. They're often viewed in two rows, a top row and a bottom row, in, in a sense, two arches. Uh, so one shown in red and one shown in green. And you can see each bone has um, a particular uh, name. 
And I'll just show you something about the functionality of the wrist. So we, we need our wrist to flex, uh, maybe if we're playing the piano or, or doing some uh, craft work. We also need our wrist to abduct and adduct. Uh, if you're playing table tennis, very important to be able to move your wrist in that direction. Also, the wrist has to load transfer as well. Um, if you're doing a press up, then quite a lot of force is going through your uh, wrist. So the wrist is not just a mechanism joint, but it's also a structure as well. And on top of that, the wrist also forms a carpal tunnel, because as we were uh, seeing just now, uh, many of the tendons for the fingers originate in the lower arm. So they have to safely travel to the hand. And one of the ways they do that is to go through a protective carpal tunnel, uh, which is formed by the wrist bones. So let's look at some of those uh, functions. First of all, the flexion extension. One of the things we notice here is that there's a double joint. There's a radiocarpal joint with the lower arm and there's a midcarpal uh, joint right in the middle of the wrist. And that gives you that uh, large range of motion having two joints. But uh, another remarkable feature of that joint is that it has a common center of rotation. And the reason it has a common center of rotation is that the radius of the bones are exactly fine tuned to give you a common center of rotation. So when you move your wrist, you wouldn't know that you had two joints in it. It looks like one common joint, but that's only because of that fine tuning of a common center of rotation. Then the second function is the adduction and the abduction. And again, we see two joints, a midcarpal joint, a radiocarpal joint. And again, you get movement in uh, both. And not only that, but you have the same ingenious design feature whereby the radius of the, those two joints are exactly fine tuned to give you a common center of rotation. So double jointed in both directions. But on top of that, uh, we can also perform oblique flexion. Uh, if you do a motion like throwing a dart, you're both flexing and abducting or adducting at the same time because the wrist joint is a biaxial ellipsoidal uh, joint. It's like a universal joint. It can move in two different directions. As en every engineer knows, that requires a lot of precision design to make a biaxial joint, but it's not just biaxial, it's double jointed in both directions. So the wrist is really a remarkable, uh, precise design a lot of functionality uh, packed into a small space. I mentioned another function was for load transfer. I've heard some people say, uh, why should the wrist joint have those eight bones? You know, what's the logic in the design of those bones? Well, there's a lot of logic in the bones. If you apply engineering principles, you can see form and function in the wrist joint. Uh, one of the subjects I teach in university is structural design. And one of the principles of structural design is to avoid, as far as possible, bending loads, shear loads, try to focus on compressive loads. And that's exactly what the wrist joint does. As you can see, the fingers are lined up with the bones of the wrist joint. And that gives you a very neat compressive load path from the fingers into the two bones of the lower arm. So it, it is um, an ideal, uh, ideal design from a structural point of view. But what's remarkable is that it's both ideal from a kinematic joint design, as well as being ideal from a structural uh, perspective. So the wrist joint is a multifunctioning joint and remarkably optimized, not just for kinematics, but for structural design as well. And as I mentioned, the wrist also forms a carpal tunnel for tendons, blood vessels and nerves. And remarkably, that carpal tunnel is made up of six bones, uh, four from the upper arch and two from the lower arch. 
So you can see the wrist as a triple arched structure integrated in three dimensions with two arches in the plane of the hand and one arch in the transverse direction of the hand. So this humble looking tiny joint, the wrist joint, actually is, is a really remarkably well designed and optimized. So the human hand uh, is an incredibly uh, incredibly well-designed uh, hand. So now we come to part two, the unique human uh, foot. And like the hand, it's an amazing design. I mean, I should I just mention at this point that uh, in working for the European Space Agency, I've had the privilege of designing some of the most advanced mechanisms and structures really ever designed uh, by, by, by human engineers. And I can say that nothing compares with the design of the human hand and the human foot. I think these two structures are two of the most impressive mechanical structures anywhere in the world and, and probably probably in the universe. Um, uh, it, it's, it, they are really remarkable structures. And you, and you may not think that your feet are the most beautiful part of your body, but from a mechanical point of view, I can assure you they are uh, a, a very beautiful part of your body. So a little bit like with the human hand, the human arched foot is very, very different to an ape flat foot. It's like chalk and cheese. You, you can hardly begin to compare a human foot with an ape foot. A human foot is designed for standing, for running, for standing on the ball of the feet. Um, it's a stiff arch structure, triple arch structure. There's a stiff big toe pointing forward. An ape foot is really like a hand. It's designed for grasping. It's a flexible structure, has a flexible big toe. And when a, um, an ape puts its foot on the ground, you have this distribution of force reaction. Whereas in the case of a human foot, you have you are you're, you're reacting your feet under the arched uh, contact points. Very very different. So I will talk mostly about the ankle foot complex, uh, mostly about the hind foot and the mid uh, foot. In a way, these are the most important parts of the um, arch. So like the wrist, like the fingers, the foot is a multifunctioning uh, device. Uh, I'll go through four very briefly. Firstly, the fun first function, a structure for standing, either two legged standing or one legged standing. Apes cannot stand on one leg. And I'll explain why. Uh, we have function two, a stiff lever for push off, for running and walking. Uh, apes cannot stand on their toes, they can't run. Function three, flexible structure, particularly for landing and running, but also for stretching. And then function four, load uh, transfer. And as before, it's an incredible amount of functionality in a small space. So we have this ingenious design, three integrated arches. Your first three toes, big toe, second toe, third toe, they form what's called the medial arch. That's your strong arch with the strong big toe. Then you have a lateral arch. That's more of a flexible arch, a lower arch. They're made by your two small toes. And then you have a transverse arch. It's a connecting arch. And what you can what you can observe, for example, in the medial arch, you have three cuneiform bones and a navicular bone that line up your medial arch. Uh, but then in the middle diagram, you can see how the cuboid bone enables the lateral arch to be a distinct arch. So the so the transverse arch splits up the lateral arch with the medial arch. And as we shall see, there are different functions in those three. Um, arches and uh, these arches are unique to humans in, in many ways it's the foot that is the biggest uh, challenge when when looking at human or origins so function one structure for standing we have this ingenious design that it's very easy for a human to stand upright because they can feel a force reaction in the sole of the foot and the heel of the foot it's very easy to put the center of gravity th through those two points, just applying the principles of physics. It's very difficult for an ape 
to stand up because they're standing on the flat of their hands and it takes a lot of skill uh, for an ape to stand, stand on two legs. But only humans can stand on one leg because we have this three point contact. This is one of the purposes of the triple arch. Because of the triple arch, we have three point contact. And then to stand on one leg, you simply put your center of gravity through those three points on the ground. And because we have excellent upright balance, which is unique to humans, we, we don't find it too difficult to put that center of gravity between those three uh, points. So we have feet very much designed for bipedal standing and even one-legged standing. But then a second function is a stiff lever for push-off. Uh, and you can see that plantar flexion, that running push-off, now, there is a very ingenious design feature in the foot. It's actually called the windless mechanism. Uh, engineers study this uh, in some detail. Underneath your foot is a plantar fascia, a kind of ligament that joins your heel with your toes. And you have a metatarsophalangeal uh, joint on each uh, toe. When you move your toes, um, upwards, and this this happens when you push off when you're running. When your toes move upwards, it tightens the plantar fascia uh, ligament, and when it tightens that ligament when you push off, that has the effect of stiffening the arch. The arch goes from being a slightly flexible arch to a very stiff lever. So what is happening is when you run your foot is continually reconfiguring itself. It's a really remarkable design. Your foot reconfigures itself. It becomes stiff when you push off in running, and then it becomes flexible when you land on your foot. Uh, a really remarkable uh, mechanism. Uh, so, what, what, so what is so special about the foot is that it can become stiff and flexible at different times. So then when you land in running, notice in this diagram on the left how I've now, that plantar fascia is now a flexible ligament because the toes are not uh, extended. So it hasn't tightened that ligament. So the arches, particularly the medial arch, is now becoming more flexible. So when you land, you're landing on flexible arches, which are a shock absorber. But there are actually four ways that you get flexibility and shock absorption in the feet. First of all, you have a fat pad under the heel, about 18 millimeters in thickness. So you have that bit of cushioning, even if you're not wearing uh, running shoes. The medial arch loosens because of that mechanism for tightening that uh, ligament. All three arches uh, flex and have some flexibility. And also the ankle pronates. And between those four mechanisms, you get uh, shock absorption. So just ex to explain some of those things I was just talking about, on the left, you can see flexing of the transverse arch. Even though the ligaments are very tough, there's a little bit of give, and there are so many joints in the foot, so many bones and so many joints, that a little bit of movement at each joint adds up to quite a lot of flexibility. You also have heel pronation that gives you shock absorption. There's another joint, uh, just below the talus bone, above the calcaneus, and that moves sideways to give you some uh, pronation. And then on the right, I'm just illustrating a very ingenious design. There's a linkage mechanism, uh, a little bit analogous to a four bar mechanism, but it's actually more complicated than that. But it's basically a linkage mechanism that stabilizes the ankle joint and also gives um, a very convenient anchoring point for many muscles in the um, ankle. So you can't just look at the foot on its own. You have to consider the fibula bone and you have to consider that linkage mechanism to understand what goes on in the foot. So a lot of very remarkable mechanical features we see in the foot. And as with the hand and the wrist, we see an optimal structural design with compression load paths through the toes right through 
to the heel. So this is a really ideal design. This explains the bones in the midfoot. Um, I've sometimes heard people saying they, they can't understand why we have those five bones in the midfoot, the cuneiforms, um, the navicular the, and the other bones, but they are there to line up with the toes to avoid shear loads, to avoid bending loads and to get an optimum compression load path through the foot. So we have this brilliant design with these three integrated arches, but not just a brilliant uh, reconfiguring design that reconfigures between stiffness and flexibility, but even is optimal from a compressive load path. It's just a, a design of a complete genius. Now, in this third part, um, I just want to briefly go over evidence for intelligent uh, design because uh, from, from my experience, having worked in this area, it just screams out intelligent design. And if I can just say at this point, one of, the, one of the things I have found so surprising in my last 35 years in academia is the number of my colleagues who are so sympathetic to intelligent design, but they don't want to really say much about it. Uh, I'm really surprised how many academics there are who are so sympathetic to intelligent design. And I'll explain why. So one of the reasons is what I call purposeful overdesign in the hands. The, the human hand is clearly designed for more than survival, more uh, than hunter gathering. The human hand is exactly what would be expected from intelligent design, from a, a maker who wanted humans to play musical instruments, to do skillful things, to hold a pen to do things more than survival. Now, why is this so relevant to the origins debate? Well, evolution predicts no purposeful over-design. Uh, th this, this is a quote from Professor Stephen Jones. Evolution does its job as well as it needs to and no more. Now, this is a very important admission. The whole point of evolution is if there's no purpose, it should not be there. And that is why on the bottom reference, you can see these two researchers at the bottom, they propose that the, the reason for our fingers, our wrist, our hands, is because of our need to form a fist and to punch someone in the face. So the origin of our hands is based in fighting, holding a club, throwing a punch. Uh, it's not, you know, we aren't designed, you know, we aren't evolved to play musical instruments and to do skillful things. But of course, the challenge to evolution is if you look at the human hand, it's, you, it, you, it can't be designed to throw a punch. It's designed mainly to play a musical instrument. I joke with people and say the reason we can form a clenched fist is so that we can play squash because that's a very, it's a very good game. Um, then secondly, the scientific evidence is hands are superior to prosthetics and Considering that engineers are not restricted to evolving step by step, uh, it would be very surprising from an evolutionary point of view if engineers cannot uh, equal the design of the human hand. And here are just a few quotations from uh, researchers in the field who marvel at the brilliant design in the human hand. That first reference uh, is talking about the scarcity of three of degree of freedom, uh, compact powered wrist devices. Wrists are so bulky and lacking in functionality compared to the human wrist. Then the next quotes are singing the praises of the human hand. Uh, one, um, the wrist is one of the most complex joints in the human body, allowing for stability during movement in all three planes, thanks to its robust anatomy. Uh, that's from a, a, a teaching material. Uh, the wrist exhibits a remarkable range of movement with highly variable force. Um, a standard text, uh, essentials of kinesiology. This ability to form a cup shape is one of the most impressive functions of the wrist. And even Isaac Newton has got a quotation, the thumb alone would convince me of God's uh, existence. So the evidence is very much that the human hand is a wonderful design. But this is very much at odds 
with what is recently coming out of the evolutionary camp, for example, Nathan Lentz, uh, promoting evolutionary teaching philosophy. He's written a book called Human Errors, uh, published in 2018. And he claims that the wrist joint in the human hand is a terrible design. For example, he says the wrist bones are the most obnoxious examples of bones for which we have no use. Now, Nathan Lentz, who's from a university in New York, he's actually a geneticist himself. But because he's applying evolutionary philosophy, based on evolution, he's predicting that the wrist joint should be a bad design. And in a sense, I agree that if evolution is true, then the wrist should be a bad design. But it's only a prediction. It's, it's, it's actually not based on scientific uh, evidence. And to me, this shows how evolutionary philosophy can be really quite destructive to scientific inquiry, because what you find is that evolutionary philosophy forces the evolutionist to impose an interpretation despite the evidence. Now, you might have heard um, examples of where evolutionists claim that's what the intelligent designer does, but I have I have heard academics admit that it's more the other way round. It's actually the evolutionist who forces an evolutionary philosophy to such a large extent that they're actually ignoring the evidence. How, so how about evidence of intelligent design in the foot? Well, again, the scientific evidence is that feet are masterpieces of engineering. Just to give you some examples from one Leading biomechanics book, many contractile, non-contractile structures work in perfect synchronization in the foot. The ankle midfoot is superbly constructed for ambulation. Although the human ankle foot structure is immensely complex, it seems that its configuration and also each constitutive component are well tuned to maximize locomotor efficiency and minimize risk of injury. You see, at first, you can think this is a very complex structure does it need to be so complex but yes it does in order to have this amazing performance and then finally leonardo da vinci the foot is a masterpiece of engineering and i believe modern science has proved him to be correct so evolution predicts bad design in the foot i agree with that so nathan lentz has made these claims he says the ankle would function better as a few structure the ankle contains seven bones, most of them pointless. No reason to have the fibula in the lower leg. The ankle can do nothing but malfunction. Now, those statements are incredibly erroneous, so at odds with not just scientific research, but basic biomechanics knowledge. Some of my colleagues completely cringe when they read these things. But again, it's a prediction of evolution. It's not based on scientific evidence. And again, it shows you how destructive evolutionary philosophy can be when you force an explanation to agree with evolution rather than to observe the basic facts. Let's just go through those statements, uh, some of the ones that Nathan Lentz just mentioned. He just said, the ankle would function better as a fused structure because he thinks it's just too complicated. Well, what is the scientific evidence? The internal ankle joints are extremely important for pronation. Uh, so what Nathan Lentz thinks should be uh, fused together, well, it's actually, they're really important. Walking on rough ground is difficult after a fusion. Most people cannot play vigorous sports such as squash after a fusion. So while well, squash, that's my game, I certainly don't want to have a ankle fusion. Once a joint has been fused, the joints above and below the joint take on more strain. Uh, so that's just showing how erroneous that statement is. So Lentz goes on to say, no reason to have the fibula in the lower leg. But the scientific evidence is very clear. The whole fibula is essential for the stability of the ankle joint. And there are lots of papers that explain uh, the same thing. So a very basic error. And then one more, uh, Nathan Lentz says the ankle could do nothing but malfunction. It's got a very low view of the ankle. Another evolutionist, Jeremy De Silva, uh, said the evolution of a stable lever structure from a grasping one has left us particularly susceptible 
to a variety of foot and ankle injuries. Now, that is not based on scientific evidence. Again, it's another prediction of evolution. And just to explain, uh, th there was th there have been various scientific studies, scientific papers, explaining why we have injuries in our ankle joint. And what they show is that the ankle is not prone to injury. For example, uh, this is a quotation from this paper. Running is rarely associated with acute ankle sprain. Risk factors include rapid increase of training intensity and overload. What the paper has explains is the reason you often hear of ankle injuries is not to do with the design of the ankle. It's to do with the negligence of the person who has the ankle. People are very bad at overloading that ankle, at doing uh, silly things. It's not the design of the ankle itself. Just to give you an analogy, modern cars are very robust and reliable. But if you drive into a lamppost, you find that the car uh, gets overloaded or doesn't work anymore. That's not to do with the design of the car. It's to do with the person driving the car. So cars can fail if neglected, overloaded, crashed or old. But the same is true of our ankle. Uh, we can easily injure our ankle if we neglect it, if we overload it, if we crash it, or sometimes if it gets um, old. So it's very important to separate design from use. Uh, then finally, uh, something about fossil evidence. Uh, I'm sure this will come up in the questions. Basically, fossil evidence supports the special creation of man. And in particular, there's no evidence for transition from flat feet to arched feet. So there has been a claim that Australopithecus had arched feet. In 2011, Carol Ward published a paper uh, based on the shape of one toe bone. She said a complete fourth metatarsal of um, Australopithecus uh, afarensis was recently discovered at Haida, Ethiopia. It exhibits torsion of the head relative to the base. These features support the hypothesis that the species was a committed terrestrial biped. Now, remember, this is based on one single uh, bone. It's not even the midfoot or the ankle joint, but it's just one of the toe bones. Um, so it's making a lot of conclusions over a tiny, tiny piece of evidence. But interestingly, after this one toe uh, theory, uh, based on that, in Science Daily, they said researchers would have found proof that arches existed in a predecessor to the human species that lived more than three million years ago. And then museums had upright um, ape men walking in their museums based on that one single bone from one single toe. But what people don't hear is this next paper, because in 2012, there was a paper written that discredited the 2011 Ward paper. So Mitchell et al, who published in the Journal of Comparative Human Biology, they said none of the correlations Ward et al make to localized foot function were supported by our analysis. Basically, they went through and said, you know, they, they cannot make those conclusions based on that one bone. Uh, it, it, it's completely wrong what they've done. They said this study highlights evolutionary misconceptions underlying the practice of using a single bony element to reconstruct overall locomotor behaviours. But you can probably guess that when this paper came out, discrediting the first paper, uh, there was very little publicity and people like Science Daily didn't retract their statements or correct their statement saying, well, it's been proved that arched feet have uh, evolved. You can't evolve an arched foot because, as every engineer knows, arches are irreducibly complex structures. You need the whole st structure there with the key bone. You can't evolve it step by step. So what is the evidence for intelligent design? Just to summarize, uh, we see in the hand and the feet ingenious solutions, triple arch structures, linkage mechanisms, biaxial double joint, so brilliant that engineers are desperate to copy them. We see irreducible complexity, particularly in the arch structures of the feet. If you look at how arch structures are built, they're normally built with temporary jigs. Uh, and the reason they're built with temporary jigs is you cannot build it step by step. 
Then we see multifunctionality, strength, flexibility, joints, balance, tunnels. Multifunctioning design is very difficult and requires immense planning from the beginning. We see fine tuning of the three point contact, the arch alignment, common centers of rotation. And we see ultimate performance in terms of compactness, efficiency, and endurance. Uh, engineers are just in awe of the performance of human hands and human feet. And finally, the absence of bad design, despite what some people uh, are trying to are trying to claim. If you're interested uh, to know more details, I've published um, a paper in Biocomplexity, Volume 2022. It's called Why the Ankle Foot Complex is a Masterpiece of Engineering and a Rebuttal of Bad Design Arguments. Uh, it's quite easy to look that up on the web. I've written a, a related paper in the secular um, uh, journals in the Institute of Physics. I have published a paper in Bioinspiration and Biomimetics. It was a review paper of linkage mechanisms in animal joints. And I cover 10 animal joints and it's quite clear I'm describing irreducible complexity, although I don't mention it in those terms in that paper, but that's a, a linked piece of work if you're interested. I have a little bit more in my, in my website, prostituteburgess.com, and I've written various books. A couple of books most related to this talk are Wonders of Creation and In God's Image, but I hope you found that interesting and encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart, um, I think I'm going to be the first in a long line of people to thank you for that talk. I found that particularly um, fascinating and informative. Um, I also suspect that my colleague David Galloway is in a far better position than me from his medical background to um, comment and probe on some of the issues you said. But um, we've had some comments and questions coming in, so it forced me to, to host that. And I'm sure that my colleagues will We'll jump in as well with any comments and, and questions but can i kick it off with with this one stuart you've talked about the 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 um the foot or the feet you've talked about the hand or the hands uh, and the question relates to the singular and the plural uh, in that to what extent if any does the fact that we have pairs symmetrical pairs of hands and feet um add to the design argument uh, yeah, that, well, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, having a left hand and a right hand, the fact that they're not identical gives us a little bit of extra skill and dexterity when we're manipulating um, our hands. It also gives us a little bit of redundancy. If sadly you lose one hand, uh, it's remarkable what you can still do uh, just with one hand. Uh, of course, in the case of the feet, you need two feet to do your walking. Um, uh, one thing I didn't mention is that uh, humans are very well designed for the skill of movement in sports. Um, apes cannot play sports, uh, almost all sports, because one of the key things in a sport is to be able to stand on the ball of your foot. Um, in many sports, uh, in order to suddenly change direction or change motion on one foot, you need to stand on the ball of your foot. And we have a remarkable ability to change direction very quickly. And that's something that apes cannot do because they cannot stand on the ball of their feet. So particularly with feet, it's very we do very much use um, feet on an individual basis to suddenly change direction or to stabilize our walking or running. OK, now another comment is. Um, it brings the point that the the development or the design of the feet and the hands is intrinsically linked to the brain um uh, and so to what extent if any does that make uh, the evolutionary pathway more difficult in that not only do you have to explain uh, when you've talked about the irreducible complexity of the arch but whatever it is you have to explain let's assume one is one is positing a pathway from um ape or ancestral um, ape to, to um, humans. Yeah, it's a very good point because in the human motor cortex in the brain, um, a quarter of it is dedicated to controlling the hands. So 
uh, the designer has given us a motor cortex. He, he's given us the software and the hardware for the hands uh, or a computer hardware in the brain, not just the mechanical hardware in our hands. Uh, so that proves that we are designed to do skillful things with our hands because God has given us the brains to control those hands as well. So it is an added level of irreducible complexity. You need that very sophisticated motor cortex at the same time as having all those sophisticated structures in the hand. So yeah, it's it's a it's a good point. Obviously, I was focusing on the mechanical design, but yeah, you need to look, you you also need to look back at the whole uh system and then yeah that 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 makes it an even bigger challenge for a naturalistic explanation okay now um you commented earlier in your talk about um colleagues or or, or, or people in academia that may quietly or, or um underneath the radar uh, agree with what you're saying um there's a few questions arise from that number one um, why do you think they insist on staying under the radar? And and number two is, is that across a, a broad range of disciplines, or do you find that certain disciplines are more open to uh, drawing the conclusion of design than others? Okay, well, yeah, these are big questions. First of all, in engineering, uh, there is a preponderance, there's a great number of people um, sympathetic to intelligent design, I think because they they know firsthand that design does not happen by chance. It's very, very difficult. They know firsthand that systems become unstable very quickly. That if you do random changes, designs break down. So within engineering, there's tremendous sympathy for my uh, position. If I go into the coffee room and talk about intelligent design, I find it very hard to find someone who who wants to argue against my case. That's been my experience uh, for decades, but I have deliberately made friends with biologists in the universities where I've worked. And interestingly, what I found is that I find it very easy to make friends with microbiologists. So um, at Bristol University, there were three particular professors of microbiology who I became very friendly with. One was uh, Professor Alan Linton, and he was open about his Christian faith. He rejected evolution, even though he was head of department of microbiology at Bristol University, uh, he was outspoken. But there were two professors of microbiology who had no religious agenda, and they were tremendously supportive of me, but wanted it kept absolutely quiet because they realized it could cost them uh, their, their reputations. One of them became head of school at Bristol University, which is a very senior biology uh, position and he was tremendously sympathetic and he didn't tell other people but he secretly followed intelligent design publications and websites and the discovery institute and he would use arguments um he would tell me arguments that i hadn't even seen myself so he would say evolution is a little bit like a magic wand you wave your wand and you just say evolution did it um, and he said, it's, it's evolution, which is God of the gaps, not intelligent design. And he was telling me this. This was someone who had no religious agenda, who wasn't a Christian, um, who just from basic scientific facts was prepared to admit that to me. To me, this was one of the biggest, this was almost a bigger evidence for creation and intelligent design than even the physical evidence when a professor like that could make that uh, admission to me. So to me, this has been one of the most fascinating things, the conversations I've had with my colleagues. Well, in that case, the obvious follow up is um, how do you explain the resistance? How do you explain the, the strength of opposition and strength of feeling? Yeah, that's a difficult thing to explain. So my my experience is that the majority of academics are fairly apathetic, um, agnostic. There's a minority of very, very vocal uh, kind of humanist um, academics. They're very vocal. They kind of bully people who don't fall into line. The, the question you just asked me, I did ask to the very senior microbiologist who I became friends with at my university. 
I asked him that question. He said, well, I'm going to go away and I'm going to do a survey amongst lots and lots of biologists to find the answer for you. And and so he said to me, well, yeah, to protect your career, you you can't um, talk about intelligent design. It's it's bad from a scientific point of view, but you've just got you've just got to toe the line and have a humanistic viewpoint. We've all decided to ignore God, even if there's no rational basis for that. And to be quite frank, um, a lot of academics, their biggest concern is not whether evolution is true. Their biggest concern is the parking space, the pension, the summer holidays, the pay rise. That's the status quo is more important than 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 showing that evolution is actually uh, an incorrect theory. Can I ask specifically, and it may be that, that um, David Galloway can come in on this. Um, what about in the not so much in in um, with biologists, but what about with medics? What what, what do you find their reaction when they um, see either as part of their their um, training learning experience or or, or, or or once they're qualified, they see the the type of type particularly if they specialise in the sort of areas you've highlighted tonight. Um, how, do they just take it for granted? Do they question it? Are they open to it? Uh, yeah, I've spoken to many medics in terms of education, uh, both staff and students. They can't see the point of learning about evolution. They can't see any purpose, you know, whether it's true or not. They don't see it as important at all in medicine. So it's almost like a waste of time if the lecturer talks about evolution. So they're quite ambivalent to it during education. Then when people practice medicine, you do often find uh, they can see that actually uh, the human body is very fearfully and wonderfully made and there's a lot of precision uh, engineering involved. So you do see a change in attitude. But I was explaining that I see a big change between the microbiology department and the general biology department. Many universities have separate departments and those who just deal with general concepts and philosophy like evolution, the more distant they are from the labs, the more open they are to just believing in any old just so story. So the, the kind of work people do does have a big effect on how later they view origins. Yeah, I'll come in on that, David, if you like, since since you suggested mm -hmm. that. I, I think Stuart is absolutely right. What he has said about the academics and university life would be mirrored pretty much in the medical scene as well. So, so largely people are apathetic, somewhat agnostic. They will go along with what is seen to be an adequate explanation in the minds of many people, but it's only when you then present them with the various conundrums that exist or the incredible examples, which are undeniable of genuine purposeful design that they can do nothing else but admit that actually there is a case here that needs to be answered. But at the end of the day, is it really going to carry the kind of weight? Do they really follow it through to the implications that it has in terms of a sort of worldview issues, which of course uh, are part of the reason why we're, uh, we're even running these webinars in the first place, because of these implications, because of the importance of, of the conclusions that can be drawn. But I think it's a real parallel. Well, can I can I ask the same question to both of you then, um, David and Stuart? There's, there's a question that's come in, which is, um, what consequences, if any, have you faced for being openly pro intelligent design? Um, you've you've hinted more than hinted, Stuart, that that there is a significant um, risk factor or career um, uh, factor if people in certain departments were to say things. Um, so have you personally experienced that and to what extent? And, and the same question after you've answered it to David, which is to what extent would it, would it affect someone who was seeking to develop a, a, a career in medicine? Uh, yeah, in my case, there have been some consequences. Um, I think being in engineering, I've been somewhat protected compared to someone who's in, but it's very difficult if you're in a biology department, for example. Uh, so engineering, I've been protected, but what has happened is uh, people from humanist groups, many, many have written to my university asking me to be demoted or fired, or there have been many requests for me to be 
uh, if I'm giving a talk, like the talk I'm giving today, that I do not mention Bristol University, that I say that what I'm talking about is disconnected from my work. Well, as you will see, almost everything I, I spoke about is connected with my work. But I've had people writing to my university demanding that I make a statement that these are my own religious views. They're not connected with my professional work. Many of those requests have gone in and there was a point where I was worried they might actually come into effect. But I have had, on the other hand, I've been surprised how much support I have had from my dean, from the vice chancellor. Um, so I, I am thankful to them. And some of them are not religious, not Christian. So, yeah, I, many people have written to my university. Sometimes I found it harder when they've written to people under me because I've been a head of department uh, than, than people above me. Um, so a lot of pressure. And there have been organizations who've written pretending to be um, based from a scientific institute who haven't been based on. So there's been some really underhand tactics in people trying to uh, attack me. So yeah, th so this is a reason why a lot of academics are very, very hesitant to support intelligent design because you do get uh, all kinds of subtle uh, attacks. Yeah, I think I think I would agree with that. The, the, uh, the usual knee-jerk response when the topic of intelligent design comes up is that, and it's just assumed or asserted that this is some kind of pseudoscience, this is creationism dressed up in a tuxedo or whatever the various uh, paradigms that people tend to use. The reality is when, when the evidence is presented, it is so strong and so undeniable that you genuinely rarely get any significant credible pushback. Uh, and I think it's startlingly disingenuous for people to maintain uh, a set of ideas and arguments that are very difficult to defend in the face of that evidence. And I certainly not, not encountered any significant personal pushback. I mean, I've been open on the web about my thoughts about design. I've written about it. I've lectured on it many times as a steward, I know. And, you know, questions arise, genuine questions arise, of course. But when the evidence is presented, it is so strong. Uh, that I think it's undeniable and, and people are not prepared to continue to attack uh, unless they have a particular axe to grind. And there are a few of those around, of course, who will just uh, doggedly hold on to their worldview driven position, no matter what evidence you present with. OK, well, um, one final question to finish then, um, Stuart, it's building on a, on a comment straight question that's come in on the live chat. Um, and it's you've talked about the, the way the um, the person has put it is you've you've talked about the finished articles uh, and their question relates to the uh, i suppose the development they've talked about development in the womb um have there been uh, or are you able to comment you've talked uh, i'm trying to sort of pull some strands together here you also obviously showed the differences between human and ape um are there are there studies uh, that you think are relevant or that you can point us to to deal with the, the the development of uh, from an from an embryo uh, onwards, uh, and um, whether they've sought to explain either from an evolutionary or from a design point of view the um, the differences between uh, the species. Uh, well, just um, first of all, answering that just for the human being, like uh, the development of the hand or the foot, there's a lot of research going on at the moment. Uh, as to how the body can assemble a complex joint like the hand or the foot. Now that adds another level of complexity that I haven't even touched on this evening. How do you manufacture and assemble bottom up the hand and the foot? That's another kind of dimension to the wonder of the design. Um, at the moment, the, it's largely unknown how the body is able to um, assemble ligaments with the right anchor point. It, it, it's the most incredible thing. And it's, it's one of the things that is, that is one of the most unknown aspects of how the human body operates, how it assembles itself. And certainly the difference between humans and apes, that's, that's very much unknown. It, it, most of the research goes on with humans, not apes. Um, but even in the case of humans, there's a lot of it's mostly gaps in knowledge as to how joints 
uh, are able to become assembled. It may be that in the coming years, we'll see more of the wonder of that. But what that will show is, again, the incredible complexity involved in building a joint. OK, well, Stuart, um, thank you ever so much for your um, talk this evening. There's um, there's one question which come in which I will answer, which is uh, whether or not these webinars are available to watch again. Uh, the answer is yes, they are. You can watch them on YouTube. They're on the the um, the, the ID channel that, that if you're watching on the live chat now will be on YouTube or you can get them on the website. See C4, the number four, ID dot uh, org dot uk and you can see this talk and the other talk in the series but Stuart as I, I repeat again thank you ever so much for a, uh, a fascinating uh, talk uh, and um, I'm going to hand over now to David Galloway for his closing remarks. Yeah let me let me echo that Stuart that really was fascinating and actually I've been monitoring some of the the uh, chat coming in on YouTube and it's been described as fantastic fascinating sensational and I agree with all of these descriptions. Actually, when you when you began with that picture from Grey's Anatomy, you know, I had this sense of foreboding begin to build up as it took me back to my second MB anatomy. But one of the fascinating things was actually dissecting the human hand. The foot was a bit more difficult, but the hand was just amazing. And there are all sorts of things that you didn't refer to tonight, so much in relation to sensation and so on. But in terms of the motor, the motor setup and configuration of the hand. Some of these tendon insertions and so on can be used very specifically to make a diagnosis of a particular tendon injury or whatever in the forearm or in the wrist. And uh, just making use of some of these incredible connections uh, can be used in clinical practice uh, as well. So it really is, it is fascinating. Let me just uh, finally, as I thank you, thank everyone for, for joining us this evening. Uh, make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel. Make sure that you're connected with our various communications, which can be uh, accessed via the website that David mentioned. Uh, Stuart had mentioned also some of his publications and his website, so uh, make sure you have a chance to, to access that as well. We're planning some further webinars in due course. Uh, we don't have any specific details for you yet, but if you're on our email list, then you can certainly expect uh, to receive that communication from us in due course. One final thought, and it's this, Stuart, you spoke about purposeful over-design. That's a fascinating concept. And it just made me think, you know, that some of the opponents of this argument are rather guilty of purposeful over-interpretation. <laughs> but there we go. We'll just let that slide. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us tonight. And we look forward to connecting again at a future webinar. So thank you.